service on page 184. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgive me. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, your merciful sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment, that I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you in your mouth's mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the responsive singing of the psalm printed in the bulletin. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them turn back because of their shame, who say, aha, aha. But I am poor and needy, hasten to me, O oh, oh God. You are my help and my deliverer. O oh Lord, do not delay. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. be to God on high.
The Lord be with you. Lord God, Heavenly Father, send forth your Son to lead home his bride, the church, that with all the company of the redeemed, we may finally enter into his eternal wedding feast through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from Amos in the fifth chapter. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord! For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feast days. I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear that melody of your stringed instruments. But let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle lesson is from 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but rather go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him into the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Confess our saving faith with the Nicene Creed on page 191. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God. Who for us men and for our salvation 
Christ Jesus. Amen. Our text is from the Old Testament reading, verse 24. But let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. The fellow redeemed. In the Old Testament, we are introduced to a prophet named Amos. And Amos was a prophet of a very difficult time in Israel's history. God sent Amos to chastise Israel and announce his divine judgment against them as a nation. Now, God sent a lot of other prophets to Israel to do the same thing over the years, but what complicated Amos' mission was that life was particularly good in Israel at the time. It is easy to tell people about impending judgment against sin when everything is going wrong and the people are at risk. But people are a lot more prone to ignoring those requests to repent, those commands to repent, when everything is going great in life. As an example, I recently read the story of a man who spent the, remain, the, uh, the majority of his adult life as a proud member of the homosexual community. And he had convinced himself that it was okay and his sexual choices were still pleasing to God. He convinced himself, as did his friends, that the Bible didn't really say homosexuality was a sin. And he was comfortable in his life. Life was good. He was happy. Right up until that moment when the doctor told him he had AIDS. Then suddenly that sentence of having AIDS and the possibility of having a disease that could actually take his life affected how he looked at himself. He realized he could have to stand before the judgment seat of God in a very short time and give an account for his life, and it scared him. So he went to his pastor from his childhood, and he confessed his sins, and he sought Jesus' forgiveness, and he was forgiven, and he was restored to God's grace. And this man, who was a Lutheran, by the way, still is a Lutheran, in fact, says he continues to struggle with desires that are not pleasing to God, but he repents every day, and he doesn't give himself over to those sins anymore. So facing death, seeing your life take a sudden turn for the worse, does tend to make people more ready to take God seriously. But being at peace having everything go great, being comfortable and cozy, that tends to make people ignore the judgment of God. And that was the situation Amos faced. Things in Israel were going great. They were enjoying a period of prosperity. They weren't fighting any wars. There were jobs for people. Crops were growing in the fields. People had money in their pockets. Everything was great. And the Israelites also appeared to give God credit for all of this. They were faithful, worshiping, and bringing God their offerings. They sang hymns of praise to him. They kept all the feasts God's word commanded. So everything seemed to be right between them and God, and it looked like God was blessing them as a nation because of it all. Amos' challenge was to convince the people that despite how everything looked, they had, in fact, forsaken God, and God was angry with them. It was true that they were faithful in their religious practices, but it was also true that they weren't just worshiping the true God. They were also faithful in religious practices to false gods. In fact, at this point in history, the ten tribes of the northern kingdom changed the God of the Bible into an image that was more palatable for them. They actually created an image of God in the form of a golden calf, which they prayed to and brought sacrifices and offerings to. And they worship gods that are pretty familiar to us in our day, too. Gods of self-righteousness and arrogance and greed and materialism and oppression for the weak and empty ritualism. Their religion was a lie. And their hearts belonged to the world, not to God. 
So God spoke to these Israelites through the voice of Amos. I hate, I despise your feast days, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings. See, God saw where their hearts were grounded, and they were not grounded on him. So I wonder, when you look at our nation today, are we any better? As a nation, we do look religious. A lot of people go to church every week. A lot of people claim to at least be members of a church. And we're here regularly. We give offerings. We go to the Lord's Supper. We say amen at the end of the prayers. We do the liturgy. Millions of people throughout our country engage in worship every single Sunday. And yet look where we are as a nation. We protect the murder of unborn babies by our laws and even use tax dollars for it. We have perverted marriage to include the idea of homosexual marriage. Pornography and sexual immorality are openly accepted by our culture. Our courts release criminals without punishing them. Our police officers are told to stand down and let criminals loot and destroy. Evil is prospering in our nation. We are sick. And we earn God's wrath for it every day. But the majority don't see it. Why? Because life is good. We're at peace. We got money in our pockets. And even we as Christians, sometimes we get caught up in this spirit of the nation and kind of go with the flow. We don't get too excited about the fact there are 600,000 babies murdered in our country every single year by abortion. We don't speak out too loudly against the sexual sins that are so prevalent in our day. Maybe we whisper among ourselves that we don't like it, but we certainly don't shout it out to the world. So are we any different than the Israel of Amos' day? Well, back in Amos' day, what happened was God's judgment did come to pass. He sent the Assyrians as his instruments of judgment against Israel. In less than 30 years after Amos' death, Israel would collapse as a northern kingdom. They would cease to exist, ten tribes of Israel. All their cities burned to the ground, and the people all carted off into slavery, never to return again to their promised land. They would lose everything in this world they held dear, and most of them would lose their souls as well. But it all could have been avoided. God didn't want that to happen to them. All they needed to do was repent of their godlessness and return to God's saving truths again. And God would have kept their enemies from destroying them, and he would have forgiven them all of their sins. And God's judgment can be avoided in our day, too. God hasn't given up on us as a nation or, or as a congregation. And we know that as a fact because he keeps speaking his words to us. He keeps calling us to repentance. He keeps speaking words of grace and forgiveness here in his church. God hasn't abandoned us, even though perhaps as a nation we've abandoned him. And you know, even when you look back at Israel, even though there was that period of time God did visit them with this harsh judgment, God never abandoned Israel altogether either. 700 years after Amos, God sent his son to bring what was left of Israel back into his grace for forgiveness once more. And Jesus, he took the nation's sins onto himself. He took the world's sins onto himself. And he died for all of them. So that people like you and me wouldn't have to face God's judgment. Jesus was judged right there in our place. He was judged worthy of death because he carried our sins. Throwing himself in front of the bullets meant for us, Jesus took God's judgment in his own flesh and died in our place under that judgment. 
And he did that for us, not just to save us from a judgment, but also to save us from the power of the sin that tries to pull us away from God in our lives right now. Jesus' death has made lives of repentance and faith possible for us. We are not owned by the sins that occasionally we stumble into. The filth of the world that sometimes sticks to us, that doesn't define us. We are forgiven by Jesus. That defines us. And once we are forgiven, our sins are dead to God. And now because of what our Savior has done for us, there is a new righteousness given to us. One that doesn't come from within our own heart. One that comes from Jesus himself who has joined us to his life. One that comes from the Holy Spirit that Jesus has put within us by his word of grace and forgiveness and compassion. We are now shaped and defined by God's Son. As St. Peter once put it, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. We are a people given to live holy lives in God's word in the middle of an unholy world. A people who do not conform to the corruption of the masses around us, but who stand apart and sometimes even stand alone. Now in the gospel reading today, Jesus tells a parable about ten virgins, five of which were wise, five of whom were foolish. And he tells us this parable so that we can know both what we should be and what we shouldn't be. The waiting of the bridegroom is an image for Jesus to return with that judgment. Jesus has made us his wise, redeemed children. He has given oil for our lamps, which is a symbol of his grace and mercy and forgiveness poured out on us here in his church week after week so that should he come in judgment, we are totally prepared because he has covered us with his grace. That's who we are, his redeemed, prepared, forgiven children. And we are ready to enter with him into his banquet hall anytime he returns. We should not be like the unwise virgins, those five who had no oil for their lamps, those five who had no grace, no forgiveness, who played around in the sins of the world, who got careless with their faith and let their guard down. They had no second chances. Their excuses didn't work. God's judgment fell on them like a brick wall. Jesus' warning should be taken seriously. We cannot afford in these evil days to be complacent with our faith or dabble in the wickedness of the world around us. God's judgment is real, and it will fall on those who are caught separated from Christ when he returns and who have given themselves over to godlessness and unrepentance. But Christ's grace is also real. And when he returns and finds us as his children living in his forgiveness, receiving his grace, living out these repentant lives he has given us, he will deliver us from the world and bring us into his eternal wedding hall. And Jesus knows that day is coming, and he loves us enough to make sure we're prepared for it. Right now, right here. He gives us what we need for that day, which is his mercy. He cleanses us from all our sins through his word of absolution and at his table with his own body and blood. He releases us from sin's control. So we, as his people, are drawn up into his life so that his judgment might never fall on us. May he preserve us there within him now and always. By grace, amen. Now may the peace that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with the prayer of the church.
Heavenly Father, grant us wisdom and courage in these evil days that we may be prepared at all times to receive our Savior when he comes to us in glory, that we may not be distracted by earthly glories that fade away or disillusioned by earthly disappointments which will come to an end. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, give courage to all pastors as they preach your word and to all people who hear that word, that they may believe and live righteous and godly lives before you. Keep us to that day when Christ returns and do not let our sins stand against us in your judgment. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, give aid and comfort to the sick, the suffering, and those in their last days. Grant healing according to your will and strength to bear up under the weight of loneliness and affliction. We pray especially for President Brian Saunders. We thank you for bringing him through his bypass surgery and pray you grant him healing and health according to your will as he recovers. Strengthen him in faith as well as in body, that he might make a good confession of your word as our district president. We also pray for the family of Denise Chaplin as she mourns the death of her mother. Strengthen them in your faith and truth. Point them to your resurrection and let not the pains of death overwhelm them. Build them up in faith and right life with you as they give thanks for the new life you give to all of your sheep who leave this world in faith. Lord, in your mercy. Blessed Savior, prepare us with your Holy Spirit for our reception of your body and blood, that we may be granted increase in our faith and boldness in our confession. Make us holy through your grace that we may live out before this world the faith that we have received here. Lord, in your mercy. Good Shepherd, you who loves your wandering sheep, open the hearts of those who have strayed from the faith and restore those caught up in error that they might join us again before your altar and receive your salvation, Lord, in your mercy. Merciful triune God, hear and answer the prayers of all your people that we may be content, trusting your will and wisdom to supply all that we need and that all will profit for our salvation. Hear us as we pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying. in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.